Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Lindsay Daria with Bayer Communications, and I will be your host today. We are looking forward to a lively discussion around how agriculture uh, can really help in solving the water crisis. If you've been following the ever evolving conversation around climate change, you know that water has become a critical issue. And with agriculture accounting for 70% of the global water withdrawals, we know that we can make a big impact and it's gonna take everyone working together. Today, we're gonna to hear from two experts who have been at the World Water Week conference this week, uh, are joining us from Stockholm, and they are very eager and excited to share their perspectives and their insights that they've gained this week. Following that discussion, we'll have a Q&A. We'll open it up to audience questions. So please use your chat session um, to post your questions, and then we'll take those later in the session. And with that, I'm very happy to introduce our experts. We have Frank Baggy D from Eurasia Group. He is the Director of Climate, Energy, and Resources. And he helps his clients understand evolving sustainability trends and helps them manage risk when it comes to water, biodiversity, and environmental litigation. Thanks for being with us, Frank. Thanks for having me, Lindsay. <laughs> of course. We also have Jessica Christensen with us, who is the Head of Sustainability and Stewardship at Bayer Crop Science and she's a passionate advocate for sustainable agriculture. Um, she's really focused on embedding sustainable ecosystems into business that will benefit both growers and the planet. Thanks for being with us, Jessica. Absolutely, good to, good to be here. Okay, and with that, let's start with some general information on water scarcity um, and the current challenge. Frank, with you really being the expert in this area with sustainable trends, managing risk, can you set the scene for us? How, how severe is it really? It's a good question. Um, I, I'm gonna keep it real with you. Uh, the outlook is very, very grim. Uh, right now we're in a situation where we see that water supply is reaching new lows. We're seeing that water demand is reaching new heights. So it's basically a time of records. And, and the bad ones, not the type of records that we'd like to that we'd like to break. For me, I really see three big underlying challenges here. The first one is maybe the most obvious one, which is climate change. Uh, it's exacerbating what we call physical water scarcity, right? By squeezing water supply as the planet is getting hotter. We can see it pretty much everywhere this summer. Um, then the second layer, probably the one that I'm the most obsessed with, um, it's poor water infrastructure and poor water management. And with these two joint issues, you know, you're making water scarcity worse. And if that wasn't enough, I would say compounding both issues is the fact that the global population, I think it was in November or December of last year, just hit 8 billion people. So you have here significant pressure on already strained resources. Um, what's interesting with the work that we do with Eurasia Group is that every year we put out a very forward-looking uh, report with the 10 big geopolitical risks for the next 12 months. And so this year for 2023, water stress is one of our top risks. And I want you to know that it's the first time in Eurasia Group's 25-year history that that's the case. And I think it says a lot. I was chatting with um, the president of the UN General Assembly, uh, His Excellency Mr. Karochi, uh, during the uh, World Water Week here in Stockholm. And he was telling me, yeah, Frank, I think that there's a before and after 2023 when it comes to water stress. And I think that the big story here, Lindsay, is the fact that water stress is really shifting from being a developing economy, emerging market challenge, to being a global and systemic one that is affecting every region. Now. The, the impacts will be different from one region to another. The impacts will be different from one sector to another, but we do know that agriculture will be the most affected sector by a long shot. Um, I remember this spring when, you know, in Tunisia, the government was forced to introduce water rationing. I remember just a few weeks ago in Spain, where the country is basically becoming a desert, you're seeing the mega drought that is reducing soil moisture, that is um, disrupting river flows, that is stunting crops, stunting plants during the growing season. Um, even in my home country, France, um, I think it was between the end of January and the end of February, no rain at all. It was the longest ever uh, winter dry spell. Similar challenges where uh, you and Jess are based in the US, we saw in the Western US near the Colorado River, an ongoing issue that is basically getting worse by the day. 
One thing I want to add here is that it is not just an ag issue. It's affecting every other sector. I was just um, talking to a few other experts this morning about the situation in uh, Panama near the, the Panama Canal, where you're basically seeing that the drought is affecting shipping. And that's a big deal because the Panama Canal is basically responsible for like almost half of the world's cargo ship traffic. So it's a big, big story across regions across countries and across sectors. And that's why we're really talking about uh, a global crisis. Thank you, Frank. Thank you for level setting that for us. Um, Jessica, after hearing that, especially with agriculture being one of the most affected sectors, um, can you give us some background on the role you think agriculture can play? And are there new technologies and innovations coming to market that can help? Yeah, thanks. And it's, you know, it's a dismal picture that Frank just painted. He's a very happy guy normally, just to give you some credit there, Frank. But I think we do have to give it to people straight. I think that to really get this sense of urgency. Um, I'm, I will say that it's exciting to be here at this conference. I was at the March UN Water Conference because Act needs to be part of this solution. We need to be at the table. Um, and I've seen a lot of willingness to, to let us come into to these types of meetings and, and to bring some innovation and solutions, some ideas to the table. As Lindsay mentioned, ag is the biggest user of, of fresh water, 70%, over 70% of, of irrigation water goes into ag. So I was on two panels, for example, this week. One was around um, rice. And so I'm going to use that as an example of the type of innovation and the direction that we at Bear Crop Science are going as we think about crop systems of the future and what we can do to be part of the solution. So the title of this panel was Patties for the Planet, Tackling Water Climate Challenges Through Low Carbon Rice. And so there's um, a, a few things with this, this one. Number one, it was a broad um, panel that had the public servant sector represented, it had um, our NGO groups, and it had uh, us as private industry sitting all together uh, tackling, tackling the problem. And in this one, we really were talking about our direct seeded rice strategy and our offering. So the, you know, why rice? Why would we focus on rice? So Rice, as, as Frank mentioned, I think 8 billion people. I think by 2050, it's supposed to be 10 billion people. <laughs> so an amazing amount of people that we have to feed. Rice is a staple food crop. It also supports um, over 150 million smallholder farmers in their communities. So it has a big social impact as well. It's responsible for around um, a third of that 70% irrigation water. It goes just to rice production, you guys. Um, and it also is responsible for around 10 to 12% of methane emissions. So just again for rice production. So to us, we thought, okay, where could Bear really have an impact? Where could we start um, and really try to tackle more holistically with a cropping system change and a shift? So we picked rice. And so we have a business in rice. We have a fantastic teams across our Asia Pacific region. Um, we have commitments. Uh, company commitments around water, carbon, greenhouse gases, smallholder farmer, uh, livelihood improvements. So no better place to start. What this system really is about is switching from flood patty transplanted rice, which that's a very traditional way of growing rice in many countries still in, across Asia. For hundreds of years, they've been producing rice this way, where they flood a field, they transplant little seedlings into the field. And that helps with weed control. It's just a very traditional way of growing rice. What we're doing is saying, hey, if you actually start transitioning to alternate wetting and drying, so you use a little less water there, can really help. But ideally to direct seeded rice, so you directly plant the rice without flood irrigation, so you don't have that water used there. You still need to irrigate and manage the, the crop, obviously. Um, if you do that, it can save up to 40% of water use in rice production. It can help reduce that methane um, release because how methane is generated is the water creates an anaerobic environment. And so as the plant's growing, there's a methane release from that. So if you avoid the water flooding, then you also avoid the greenhouse gas impact. So it can be very helpful there. 
and working with partners in a full ecosystem approach around direct seeded rice, we can provide a lot of services and practice changes and agronomic advice, digital tools to really help the growers be more productive and profitable. And that's the key. We have to make the farmers profitable and productive. We need to keep it simple for them to be able to really execute this. So that's the goal. We we understand it'll be challenging, um, but the teams already have a fantastic start. We're starting in India and uh, the, the commercial team has taken hold of this there. All of our technical teams have really big um, supported group basically that's working on marketing programs that are really testing this now. We're rolling it out to farmers. We're getting feedback from them. We're learning what works and what doesn't, what we need to be doing to support. And we're in partnership with lots of people and other um, parts of the value chain to make this happen. So very excited about that. The second panel I was on was around multi-stakeholder collaboration in agriculture or water management. So solutions to advance the SDGs or sustainable development goals. And so again, it was a very multi-stakeholder platform. And there I talked about rice as one example that we're, we're using, but the goal is really for us to enable our farmers to basically produce food in a more regenerative way. And so when you think about regenerative agriculture, um, you can debate about the definition. Some people don't like the term, some people do. But I think what we all agree on is it should be about outcomes at the end of the day. And, and really what we're here talking about is those outcomes also need to include productivity and profitability for growers. But that um, in that discussion, we were talking about how do we do that? What are some of the hurdles? What are some of the boundaries? Um, it was very, very good dialogue and a lot of engagement across the different sectors, which was super encouraging. Thanks for that insight, Jess. Sounds like it was a very productive dialogue. Um, kind of shifting, talking about the World Water Week Conference itself. Um, you both have participated, as you said, in several panels. Um, I'd like to get your perspectives just kind of walking out of that. Um, Frank, can you share with us maybe some of your key takeaways and do you feel optimistic walking out of the conference? Um. Optimistic is a strong word. <laughs> let's let's not get ahead of ourselves. Um, but uh, I I would say this. I think there's a strong momentum, uh, and I'm sure Jess would agree. Um, if you were to compare this World Water Week with uh, previous ones, I'm seeing a strong presence from companies across sectors, and that kind of reminds me of uh, the last Biodiversity Cup, COP15, that was in December in Montreal, where for the first time you you will really see. Um, this private sector presence to move the conversation forward. Um, so I was very surprised to see that a lot of the private sector sessions, for instance, um, both of Jesse's sessions were some of the most well attended ones. So you really see a transition from like a, an expert only gathering, if you will, to something uh, way more practical, way more tangible. And I think that that's great. We could do more, but that's a, that's a big jump already. And I think that's also reflected in the level of granularity that I see in the conversations, both on stage and off stage, um, I'm really seeing the sophistication in the in the way that people are talking about corporate water management considerations. So initially, if you will, people would only talk about water use, right? So that would be kind of like the water 101. Yes, let's focus on withdrawals. And now folks are telling me about water efficiency and water intensity. They're telling me about water pollution and water recycling. I've, I've even had a few questions on on impact assessments, on uh, innovative water partnerships, on how do we engage with suppliers uh, in a different way. So that level of granularity, I think, is also due to the fact that we have a new makeup of participants, which I think is a phenomenal thing. Um, and then maybe related to that, like a new, a new thing from this uh, World Water Week. Yeah, I would say that for the first time, people are really articulating the fact that water is not water doesn't operate in silo, right? Uh, and so people were outlining different nexuses. I, I saw like three main ones. The first one is the food, agriculture, and water nexus came out very strongly from the conversations. I think people are super duper excited about uh, the dedicated day for food, agriculture, and water at COP28 uh, in Dubai this year. It will be day 10. And there's a big push to bring water and food systems together. That I think is extremely interested. Um, I just joined um, uh, the CSIS, the think tank in the US as, a, as a non-resident expert. And 
they had a global food practice that they now expanded into a global food and water practice. And I think that's a concrete example of how you can make that happen. Great to hear that we had those conversations as well here in, uh, in Stockholm. Another big nexus that came out um, is the biodiversity and water nexus. Um, people are really having the conversation around, okay, what will disclosure looks like on the nature side? Can we bring the water component? Uh, people were talking about the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures. So how do you make sure that you have a dedicated focus on water impacts, on water risks, on water dependencies as you report on uh, nature-related risk and biodiversity-related risks? That I thought was very interesting. And maybe more surprisingly, um, there was a big focus on carbon and water. Uh, people were talking about how it is important to position water next to carbon, and they were kind of like saying in a, you know, in a tongue-in-cheek way, okay, we see that the carbon story and the climate story is very successful. How can we emulate that success, right? And and I thought that a lot of nice stuff came out from those conversations. People talking about how um, wetlands and freshwater ecosystems are critical carbon sinks. People talking about how we also know that climate change itself is changing wetlands. So how can we? tell that story in a much more compelling way to really trigger action and to, and to drive positive outcomes? How can we tell a story in terms of uh, CO2 that are not generated or greenhouse gas emissions that are avoided? So that level of quantification, that parallel between water issues and carbon issues is also a nexus that I saw and that I think is important that would speak to diverse audiences, that would speak to folks who are already familiar with the carbon story and that would probably help us uh, move the needle significantly um, on water in the next uh, few months and years. Thank you, Frank. That that's that's great for sharing. Of of course, storytelling. That's that's great to hear how that was a main focus. Um, Jess, similar question to you. Uh, what were your key points? And you know, how can agriculture and Bayer continue to play a a, a role in this fight? Yeah, I I um I agree with Frank on several points. So I think for me, one of the key key um, exciting pieces is it's not just about the why anymore. I think everybody acknowledges we all agree with the why. We might Some might disagree on little fine details, but in general, everybody, no matter where you sit, agrees with the importance and the urgency. Um, and you know, at these events, a lot of times the panels are good. You get into some good dialogue. After the panels, over a coffee or a beer is where more of the real dialogue happens, in my opinion, and the value of, of being here as well. And those discussions felt different to me this time too. So I had people approaching me, some I knew, some I didn't, um, from various parts of this, this chain, um, this group that we've got to get together to take action. And it wasn't about the why, it wasn't like, hey, tell me, you know, like, tell me more about Bear. It was more specific. It was more, hey, I would like to talk to you about this and this. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to work together. So to me, it's, it feels more action oriented which is really, really critical. Um, as Bayer, I think we're getting uh, a lot of, of credit for being a bit bolder. So at this, at this meeting, I've talked publicly about our commitments. So, you know, I, we have a, it, just with our grower side too, and the crop science, the downstream commitments we have. And, and with growers and what growers do on a field, of course we don't control that, They and nor should we. They need to make their own decisions, but we're being bold as a company saying, let us help you become more regenerative. Let us help you be more sustainable. And we're gonna put some skin in the game. We're gonna take some accountability for that. So our 30% greenhouse gas reduction of uh, the most emitting crops, is really around our farmer customers. And we're starting to, to publish baselines and methodologies around that and working with farmers. We have an environmental impact reduction goal of 30%. That's all about our crop protection portfolio. And we know that can be a tough topic for some of these uh, partners that we're working with, right? So really tackling some of those issues. When with new innovation, um, crop protection is absolutely critical in sustainable and regenerative systems and for food production. So let's meet in the middle on, on how we can address some of those um, with innovation. The you know third goal around the 100 million smallholder farmers, that's a big number. A lot of people have been impressed by that saying, you know, that's amazing. You know, talking to a lot of the indigenous 
um, communities at this this week's event, they were really appreciative that we, we were taking the time and the the and really pushing on this. And by the way, that team at Bear is doing a phenomenal job. We're tracking and reporting uh, data as we speak, up to 52 million. So it's in our sustainability reports. And the newest one that we rolled out in March was related to the rice system I just talked about a bit ago, which is around um, reducing uh, the, the water use by about 25% per kg of rice uh, produced in our footprint with our growers, right? So that's really about an efficiency play, which I think is getting a lot of great attention. And the, the feedback is that's, we gotta do more of these bold type moves we don't have to be perfect to start moving. We got to take more collective action. And I would also say it was refreshing. I was in some sessions hosted by some NGOs that invited some, some uh, uh, multi-stakeholder folks in. And I think I had some really honest discussions and they wanted to have honest discussions about, listen, I know we come from different places. We have different objectives sometimes. We like some things about each other. We don't like some things about each other. That's okay but we really do have to work together. And so to me, that was also very encouraging. I think it takes a lot of courage uh, by some of these parties that are starting to step up. So a lot more work to do. The nexus uh, with carbon and greenhouse gas and biodiversity, I agree with Frank was also spoken about, which is perfect because that's really what we're driving towards with regenerative ag systems is to really have positive outcomes um, that really encircle the environment. So COP28, there are gonna be those three pillars as Frank mentioned that are gonna be intertwined, um, including water and food systems. And so to me, that's a really critical role that Bayer can play and the ag industry in total can play um, in finding solutions and being, being part of this um, overall collaborative events and, and um, progress, right? So pretty exciting. A lot of work to do. We'll see, Frank, what momentum carries forward. Uh, now we got to get get into the action. We got to get into the action and, and have some tangible results. Okay, thank you both for sharing those perspectives with us. Um, I think we're at a point now. We're going to go ahead and start the Q and A session. We've had some questions rolling in already, and I think we're just over a thousand participants. So that's great. Um, the first question we have for you both, and maybe Frank, this is one for you to start off with, is we've heard a lot about uh, NGOs and companies coming together at this conference. Um, how can how can governments um, play a bigger role in in water issues? Uh, yeah, that's a good one. Um, it's interesting because I find that with water issues, the focus tend to be overly on companies. And I'm one of the folks who thinks that uh, governments can do a lot and should do a lot, potentially a lot more. Uh, the core, the anchor in terms of like what would be different this time around and moving forward is what I like to call a full policy shift from water crisis management to water risk management. So basically the ratio that we currently have between emergency measures, right? So there's a drought this summer and so we're gonna have a few measures for the next three months and long-term policy efforts should be completely reversed. And that will take time, but I think that the effort should really start now. I see basically three buckets for policymakers. The first one is on um, water system efficiency, right? So that means that they need to focus on overlooked, sometimes uh, 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 not so sexy uh, water solutions, so like water metering to better inform policy decisions, um, uh, leakage repair, uh, to prevent significant water loss. And we're seeing this in some very developed countries where they have like, you know, 20% of water that is getting lost. I think that's the case of like France and some other European countries, for instance. Infrastructure upgrades to really avoid those big contamination scandals or those big pollution scandals. Those are kind of like areas that they should prioritize that is in their realm and that they're not necessarily doing at scale right now. Another big topic, and I'm sure it would resonate with Jess, is water technology. I think that when you see some of the initiative that we're hearing, both in Stockholm or during this uh, LinkedIn Live, and we need a substantial increase in public and private investments to really mainstream some of those big innovative way to tackle the water crisis. Um, I'm thinking we need to mainstream rainwater uh, harvesting. We need to uh, install more industrial wastewater treatment systems. We need to ramp up significantly uh, gray water reuse. So all of those things should be kind of like priority items that should be spelled out as part of proper 
water strategies the same way governments have an energy strategy or a climate strategy. And that's not this, the case right now, definitely not at scale. And then maybe a third bucket here, I would say, is kind of related, related to what I was mentioning earlier as the water 101. But it's really water sobriety. Like, how do you just have a full mindset shift and fully recognize that water is now a scarce resource? particularly from an agricultural and industrial perspective. And so that means, you know, slowly but surely building a functioning system of check and balances among governments, among investors, among civil society organizations, and amongst uh, leaders from, from big companies to, to really ensure that we have uh, critical and ongoing progress and, and, and make sure that we achieve some of the results that we want to have. Uh, regarding SDG six, so that those are kind of like the big ticket items that I have for policymakers, and I I would say I find that it's also the job of NGOs and sometimes companies to also say, look, we're doing your part of the job, but governments, you also need to help us, and this is what we need from you. And I think that it's okay to have this two way street conversation. Yeah, I'll just add two quick things because I know we got more questions, Lindsay. But to to Frank's point, I think there was good acknowledgement every um, side session I was in, every session that there needs to be more public officials involved. So um, one session I thought, and I forget who, who the gentleman was, but it was a brilliant statement. It was, hey, we actually are more siloed at a global level. So what about like the mayors of these cities and towns and the communities within these river basins that are the most at threat? Let them work, they know how to do this. Um, so it is this kind of global to local and local to global piece, but I think there was good acknowledgement that the political side needs to step up. I, they also are hopeful as we raise attention at COP28, which does get very high political attention, that will also help raise uh, to that level, to Frank's point, so the, the governments actually do have more of a proactive water plan process started, but great, great questions. Great, thank you. It looks like we have another question around uh, water stress, and is it shifting? Um, for your perspective, do you see any shift in water stress? Uh, happy to take this very quickly. Yeah, I mean, uh, and I think I hinted at it at the beginning of the conversation, but to me, the big shift is that it's no longer your story about, oh, it's only affecting African countries or Middle Eastern countries. It's like now it's, you know, a big global story. Um, and it's also not one that is uh, only affecting one sector. It's kind of like everyone is affected, whether it's you know hydropower generation or um, even apparel and textile. I saw many many apparel and textile companies here in Stockholm, right, who are all who are actually telling me, oh, we feel like we are you know the the sister and, and brothers are buyer because we are also ag companies. And so I think that understanding also was very interesting. To the core, they were saying, you know, our, our raw materials are, are basically make us a um, agricultural companies. So. I think that the, the shift is, is at that level. Uh, and it's also in the fact that a lot of the um, dry spell or like the moments that folks would see as uh, water stress episodes are no longer just episodes. They're slowly but surely becoming the new normal. They're no longer just happening over the summertime. They're also happening during the winter time. And they are um, becoming, it's, it's like more frequent, uh, more coverage affecting regions that were not affected before, and uh, that we don't have a coordinated response right now. So time is of the essence. I, I had a few conversations with different folks and I would ask them, do you think that we need a, a cup for water the same way we have a biodiversity cup or the same way we have a climate cup? And the consensus here in Stockholm, I don't know elsewhere, but here in Stockholm people were like, Frank, we don't have time for that. It takes five to seven years to build the mechanism and the architecture to, to have a cup. We need to act now and make sure that the water conversation is part of the biodiversity cup and the climate cup. And so I think, that's kind of like where we see the shift is in the prioritization of the topic. Last thing that I want to add regarding the shift, uh, in March, uh, the UN Water Conference, there was a decision at the end to appoint a um, special envoy for water. It doesn't sound like it's a big deal, but it's actually a big deal because UN never had its own, um, water never had its own dedicated space within the UN architecture. So having a special envoy for, wa for water would change that. Uh, and I do hope that it would potentially be a catalyst for, for change and, and have a shift in the way we address water stress. Yeah, there's a, I, this is another good thing. We've, we've started talking about more speaking of shifts and not just being um, in one geography or other. It's not enough water, too much water, too hot. 
and dirty water, right? So we're starting to see that impact everybody globally. And I think that's getting the attention to Frank's point that that is now driving this at a higher level. Okay, great. It looks like we have another question around regenerative agriculture. So Jess, if you want to kick this one off, um, really about, you know, growers can be a bit reluctant to ad adopt these practices. So is there a focus, you know, what are we doing right now to help drive that adoption? Yeah, and great question. And you're absolutely right, whoever asked that question. Right? So there's multiple reasons for that. And it's it's a very personal um, thing to a farmer, to a grower. So um, here, here's the reality. When, when we're asking farmers to change practices and do some things that are pretty dramatically different, like in the direct seeded rice um, situation, we have to help them um, and bridge to when they will be more productive. And sometimes that can take a few years. So you have to change your practices and you might have some yield hits or it might, um, you know, learning curves, if you will, on how to, to manage the system differently. And so that can impact their profitability. So these concerns are very real to our, our growers. And so what we do is try to think about with ourselves, with, you know, we have very creative uh, marketing and, and product management teams that really think about how do we package a go-to-market strategy for these growers is bare to make sure we can we can help them as much as possible, even from a profitability standpoint. And then in addition, we work with partners, either from the financing world or um, other uh, folks within like irrigation companies to really pull together systems. So in the rice example, something we're really doing is called a program called Direct Acres. And so that's really taking um, you know, the input side, so around the seed, you know, we're very strong, obviously, in our innovation engine. So with our seeds and traits and our crop protection products, we have biologics division and a digital farming solutions division. So this program is really um, pulling some of those pieces together, um, as well as uh, some digital solutions, some agronomic services, more of the handholding, if you will, that, to help them um, get through the transition. Another good example in rice is we just announced a collaboration with Gen Zero, um, which is a Temasek backed um, group, as well as Shell Energy in India, to basically give pay the growers a bit of incentive for these practice changes. And this is all around us really seeing what kind of carbon uh, sequestration or carbon assets could be generated from that, um, which could potentially be used for voluntary markets or insetting. But within that, you have the water, you have the greenhouse gas. Um, so really trying to give them some extra income as farmers as well in some of these programs. But it's, it is something we talked a lot about this week. We have to kind of have this bridge financing for farmers to really be able to adopt and change. There was a debate about, well, does that create financing forever? And that's a good question, right? And it shouldn't. I mean, the idea is that they become more productive, thus more profitable. But if we can help them with upfront liquidity, cash liquidity and financing, the inputs and agronomic advice, application technology, all the way to the off takers to let's let's work together to find some good outlets where they're, they're better produced um, goods or more sustainably produced goods, that could really help them be successful and then pump up the whole system to be self-sustaining. The other discussion on that was um, government um, incentives and and subsidies. And, and it's not that those need to be taken away by any means. It's really more about how do we reprioritize those to basically incentivize growers to, to make these changes. And we're starting to see some of those, uh, that some of that happening now in certain countries where growers uh, are getting some more and different types of incentive from the, from the government officials as well. And if I may add very briefly to this, I was I was back home in Benin in West Africa this summer, and uh, I always take the opportunity to to talk to farmers when I when I go home. What was interesting when we talked about sustainable solutions for uh, for ag, a few things that they said, and I think it it, it fully aligns with what uh, Jess just said. One, they were like, okay, it needs to be a conversation. So you know, we have to be fully involved from literally ideation to implementation. People cannot come to us with, this is what you need to do and this is how you need to do it. Because we know our soil better. We have a history. We have best practices. We know what, work, what works and what doesn't. We know what is feasible and not feasible over the short, medium and long term. So it needs to be a conversation. 
And the second thing that they said, which I thought was very interesting, and I do believe that it's almost the future of all things sustainability, if we're trying to have progress like at scale, they were saying it needs to be a business conversation. It's, you know, the, the sustainable part, the sustainability part of it is very important. And we understand that it's the bedrock and the kind of end goal. But for us, we are entrepreneurs. We need to make money. This needs to make financial sense for us, right? So how can we get there? And how can we make sure that if you come with an idea, we can tell you, oh, actually, we can elevate this idea and take it to the next level instead of having a confrontation. And so I thought that those were very interesting takeaways from, from my convos with them. Great. Thank you both. Switching gears a little bit, we got a question around, you know, what can individuals do to contribute? You know, we've talked a lot about governments and we've talked about companies. Is there something you see for just someone watching right now that's just an individual? How, how can they contribute? Yeah, I can, I can start out. Um, I, and this is an important question because I, I, I know we talk about a lot in my role, we talk about big scale and impact at a global level, but I'm also personally passionate about um, what I can do it, as myself and, and with my family even. So we, at home and at work, if I'm in the office or traveling. So some very simple things. Number one, get educated about what's happening, um, how you can get involved in your local communities. Um, start at home. Think about things, simple things as, you know, energy efficient um, uh, practices, not taking super long showers, not using plastic single stream water bottles. You know, they they had these really fantastic bottles here at the, uh, I know I got a background now, but they're glass bottles and you can, they just had, you know, water jugs sitting out everywhere. Cause when you have thousands of people, you don't need plastic water bottles, right? So simple things like that at home too. Um, I've been on a, on a mission to get rid of single stream plastic in my house. I'm driving my two kids and husband nuts probably with that. But, you know, like I, I use shampoo bars and conditioner bars because there's a lot of water, just water used in, in some of those materials, right? And, and plus it's plastic. So, so there's some simple life changes you can make. And think about that at work. And no matter which kind of work situation you're in, um, think about that when you travel. But I think the bigger piece is what can you do to educate others around you in your community? So with my son's schools, we talk about what we can be doing differently um, in, in you know, your local city councils, um, your whatever your groups you're part of, little things can add up. Um, and, I, and I think from an agricultural standpoint, know, know about where your food comes from. Um, appreciate that. I, you know, I was talking about, you know, sustainably produced food, but I need to give our growers around the world a lot of credit. There's been a ton of advancement made already um, over the past 20 years in the sustainability of food production. It's quite incredible. And so one of the things I talked about at the session was, you know, get to know more about what's what farmers do. It's not it's not good or bad. It's like, hey, we've made a lot of progress. We're doing really well. Now we got to get even better with regenerative practices. And that looks different for every farmer. So I think getting to know more about your community and, and kind of where food comes from, where your, your you know, sodas come from or whatever you buy at the store is super helpful because there's a lot of passion around that. We've seen that, Frank, right, from every industry player here, um, you know, whether I was talking to, to, you know, the food and beverage side or the grain traders. I mean, there's a ton of energy in this space. And I learned a ton myself you know, which I thought I knew quite a bit about certain segments. And I'm like, oh my gosh, it's mind blowing when you actually spend some time to learn a bit more. Yeah. And I, if I could, if I may add very quickly, um, don't underestimate your voice. I think at the individual level, um, as a consumer, so in the products that you buy, uh, the, the pressure that consumers have been applying on the climate side has pushed a lot of companies to come up with climate strategies, climate goals, climate initiatives, and so on and so forth. And then also don't underestimate your voice as a, as a voter. Uh, if it becomes a priority for you, it will become a priority for your elected officials. Uh, and so I do believe that with the climate story, we have a blueprint as to how we can make water a priority across both, both uh, public and private sector leaders. And I do believe that we're getting there. Um, and, and I would say, it seems that we're getting there in a constructive fashion like because everyone is trying to understand what the problem is and how to solve it i think everyone is also like okay what do you think about this what do you think about that so to just point getting educated and then educating others and then having serious asks um and and pushing for accountability and transparency i think is the way to go at the individual level 
Great ideas. Thank you both. Uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, this is around soil moisture retention efficiency. How does how does that play into the conversation? If you could give some perspectives on that. Yeah, I can I can start. Um, it's super important. So when we think about soil health, that's one of the outcomes that we talk about uh, that we're driving with more regenerative ag systems. So soil, the soil really is the base for everything. It's the base for productivity. Um, it, it is what's going to sequester a lot of carbon, for example, can help with the greenhouse gas pieces. It's about um, uh, water retention, water quality, think about riparian zones and the environments around. Um, so to me, it's super, super important. It's also really complicated. This is one of the topics that came up this week in, in, um, in some conversations I've been having is like, we all need to come together to figure out how to approach it too, because it can be quite tricky. We have some good methodologies like the Soil Health Index, for example. Um, and like in India, we're starting in our direct seeded rice um, uh, pilots and programs, we're starting to take soil samples because it's gonna look different, right? If you're a smallholder farmer in India growing rice if, versus you're a big soybean um, corn farmer in Mato Grosso, Brazil. So we are starting to take a lot more soil data. We have a lot of data in some of those systems. For smallholders, we're really just starting to do that because it's, it's gonna be super critical, I believe, to really understand the benefits and the impacts of these, these practice changes. And I think we're gonna learn a lot. As we as we get into that, but we need help in that space. Quite honestly, I think that's where we can have a lot of collaboration as well. And one thing that I may add quickly on this is um, uh, academic partnerships. This is where we need tons of studies to come out about what are the efficient ways, the most efficient ways to go about it. What should we know and what should we know? Are we spending time on the right things? And I think that is something that we, uh, to be completely honest, we're all struggling with at the moment because those are new topics at that scale. Those are new topics. I would say though that the um, momentum that we're seeing around those topics, particularly when it comes to soil, has been extremely high here in, uh, in Stockholm. So I do believe that you'll have a lot more of those conversations uh, around Dubai, ProCAP 28, and even beyond. One thing that I want to say, though, is that this is one of the areas where there is a lot of learning that we can do from, that we can have from um, indigenous communities um, with a great understanding of their soil and like, you know, decades uh, of, of kind of knowledge, depending on the season, depending on the disruption and, and more collaboration here could also kind of like help yield type of progress that we want to see. All right. Thank you both. It is time to wrap the session. I want to thank you for your time today. And uh, it was a very fruitful dialogue. Uh, we appreciate everything you've contributed here today. Um, audience, thank you for joining. We still have a lot of questions. We'll do what we can to get those funneled and answered for you. Um, we hope you got some valuable information from this today. And if you'd like to learn more about water scarcity and agriculture, please visit uh, Bayard.com and go to the water scarcity uh, conservation page. Um, a recording of this session will be available soon on the Bayer LinkedIn channel. Um, and thank you again and all the best. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.